Hey everybody, and welcome to another board game cube shelf run through video. Although I guess the cube shelf part is no longer necessary, is it? Anyway, um, earlier this year I had done a series where I had gone through my board game collection here with the different shelves and just kind of reviewed each game and talked about it a little bit. And in that series, at the very end, I promised that I would come back at the very end of the year and talk about everything that had come into the collection since the series ended. And there is quite a bit to go through. And I did wait and procrastinate till the very end of the year, just in case something else came in. And in fact, uh, something is actually supposed to come in today. It might even come in during this uh, video recording. But uh, I'm not going to include that in the series. There's enough to go through as is. So it will come in maybe next year. Maybe I'll do something in middle or end of the year, depending on what else comes through or how much there is. But at any rate, let's talk about how this is going to go first. Um, I've got a pile, actually four different piles here, of stuff that has entered the collection since um, earlier this year when the series was recorded. It's quite a bit of stuff, so I'm going to try to keep things brisk in terms of pace. But I also want to attach a potentially long video warning to the beginning of this, just in case this does go on for a while. I hope you enjoy it, though. Uh, I wanted to do this, and I want to talk about these board games because, honestly... Let's be real, everybody. 2020 has just been a crazy year for so many of us. And uh, at least for me, board games have just been kind of a fun escape. Uh, I've definitely gotten to learn a lot of solo modes for games this year, especially being alone here in the apartment. And uh, it's been nice just to kind of discover that side of gaming that I previously didn't really know about. So I'll be talking about uh, some of that as we go through this and kind of how my perspective has changed. But this is Introduction's been going on for almost two minutes, so let's go ahead and get started with the first game on the list. This is a party game known as Guerrilla Marketing. So Guerrilla Marketing, this is a, a pun, of course, on the, the guerrilla marketing term, you know, where you're very aggressive in your marketing. And uh, this game is one of those things that on paper, it feels like it shouldn't work, but it's a lot of fun. And it's very reminiscent of the, um, I don't know how many people have played Jackbox games throughout 2020, um, but it's it feels like a board game version of one of those games uh, where you are essentially sharing something and uh, everybody else is kind of voting on it. So it's not just one person doing it like apples to apples, but everybody is doing it to everybody. And it's really well done and well produced. It's put out by Roxley Games. They're the ones who do um, uh, Dice Throne and Brass uh, Birmingham and Lancashire and uh, other games, Steampunk Rally, that's one I'm uh, hoping to get here this next year via the, a Kickstarter. But they're always well known for their productions. And this game comes in this super long box. Like, I don't know if it's very obvious that this is really long compared to most boxes, but it feels like an old, you know, 60s kind of parlor game. And uh, that's kind of the feel that they're trying to go for here with this sort of Mad Men era ad agency kind of thing where there's a bunch of gorillas. Apparently the premise is that the head of this agency was like, you know, you all suck at your jobs. I could replace you with gorillas. And then he fires everybody and does exactly that. So now gorillas are running the ad agency, which kind of explains how wacky the game is. So you are the gorillas and you are trying to come up with things to market. So what's really interesting about this is that the game is very scripted in the sense that you can follow a set of steps in order to beat the game, or to, to get through the game, I should say. So it comes with these theme packs, which are basically leaflets that are included, and they have different things that you can go through. So for example, let's say I picked uh, movies as my, my theme. So we're gonna market a movie, and each person then rolls a die. There's a bunch of dice included with the game. And the dice all have letters on them. And each leaflet, you can kind of see this list here, it has a different thing corresponding to different letters. So let's say I rolled um, a, a, an H. An H it correlates to a Western. So that's the genre of movie that I'm now going to be doing. So I write that here in my booklet. I write Western. Everybody around the table uh, then gets a chance to see that booklet and pass everybody's booklets around, kind of like telestrations. But on each round, or each turn, I should say, everybody gets to, or one person gets to roll a, uh, a bunch of dice, and they all have letters, of course, 
And those letters are going to form an acronym, and that acronym needs to be the thing that you base the, your name on. So it's going to be something totally nonsensical. Like, let's say I, I did BGB or something like that, and I had Western. I could go with Big Guns Blazing or something silly, right? And, uh, you know, the next person has something that may be less uh, obvious than Big Guns. So maybe they have W... Well, I guess that could be West, but you know, you could come up with whatever you want and uh, it gets back around to the owner of the book with, there's a thing you could do where you roll a die and there's judging criteria for the, uh, for the person who's looking at stuff. I don't really like that just because it's kind of fun just to do it on your own um, and not have to worry about that. But I think they put that in there just in case people, you know, didn't want to have any kind of inside joke kind of thing. So you could do these criteria like, most likely to win an Oscar or best ad campaign or best uh, most likely to have a lot of food on set or I don't know something like that so um, there's a lot of fun in this game I, I love this a lot it, it's kind of one of those games that you kind of have to teach as you're playing it um, but it's really cool it does definitely reminds me of things like uh, oh what's that uh, Jackbox game uh, quiplash like the the one where you get to do the, the acronyms at the end uh, you get to do two rounds one of them where you name stuff and then the other where you have like a slogan for the the winning thing from round one so let's say big guns blazing one then round two I can then market big guns blazing with a with a tagline or something so yeah guerrilla marketing I want to play this more hopefully next year when I you know hopefully we'll have more gatherings and stuff uh, but it is a fun game and definitely one I'm going to be hanging on to all right, so that is one down. Uh, I'm actually going to bring up, well, I'll, I'll get to those in a minute here, but the next one I'm going to bring up is a, is a small game called Silver and Gold. Uh, this is a flip and write game. Uh, it's sort of like a roll and write, but with cards. I, I've shown things like Welcome To and Cartographers in the past uh, in the series before. This is sort of similar to Cartographers, where you have different um shapes that you're drawing on these cards or in this case you're marking them off with x's and you're essentially like thematically you're trying to find buried treasure on all these islands and stuff so each card represents an island you're trying to go into the island and mark off every square and each round or each turn a new shape is drawn which is what that is right there and so you have to fit that into the island but you have like two islands i think going on at once so you kind of have to balance them out and figure out what it is that you're going to be doing uh, with those. So it's a nice, fun puzzle. It's very quick to play, very easy, great for two to four players. And it's just a nice challenge. It's just, it feels it, like you're getting these little micro rewards every time you complete one of these things. I like it a lot. It's kind of like an easier version of Cartographers, but it just has this very rapid fire, as the description here says, very nice quip to it, a clip to it. It's, it's just very cool. So that is uh, Silver and Gold. All right, now I'm going to bring up the multiple uh, multiple boxes. Uh, this is a set of three games that I just got in the mail from BoardGameTables.com, a publisher that I've talked about uh, on the channel here in the past. I really love how a couple of things about this company. One of them is that they are very good at packing a lot of components into a tiny box, and this these are probably the, one of the best examples of that. The other thing is that their games are very accessible and quick. They are meant to be played kind of as filler games in between bigger things, and I like that. I like that they're intentional about making things that fit into that niche. So these are three games that are supposed to take only 10 minutes, 10 to 20 minutes, and fit in a game bag just kind of as an end-of-night capper. And I'm looking forward to getting these to the table. I haven't actually played them yet, uh, unlike the other two. But I can briefly describe them to you. GPS, this is a game It's whoops, there I go again with not putting the box lids on correctly. Uh, GPS is a game where you're, you have this giant spinner that you construct out of pieces here. It's got this rocket as sort of the, the pointing thing. And everybody has these satellites, and depending on where the spinner points, you put a satellite there. But all your satellites are numbered, and you have to put them in order. So... You kind of have to figure out, okay, what's the best number to put in this spot? What am I going to do with that? And then later on, you may have to switch them around. <coughs> Excuse me. So yeah, you kind of just have to figure out what exactly are the optimal moves, depending on where this thing lands. It's really quick and, and really neat. 
The other two are the ones I'm probably slightly more excited about. Um, the first one is Sequoia, which is, has been billed as sort of a cross between uh, Las Vegas, or in the case of the version I have, Las Vegas Royale, and uh, Can't Stop, the old Sid Saxon game. Uh, you are doing this kind of area control with all these different cards that represent trees in a grove, and you're putting your own tokens on them every time you roll dice. So you roll five dice, you take two pairs of, of dice, and then you form two numbers, and then you put two of your tokens, uh, one each, on those two things. And so then there are different points, uh, uh, payouts that you get if you get the most or second most. I like this. This is a, a nice concept for a game. It's very quick. It kind of distills what Las Vegas does in an even shorter time frame. I'm not sure which one I'll end up liking more. I have a feeling that whichever one I like less will probably leave the collection eventually. But this is really neat. I, I like how, how simple it is. And there's a, a little expansion that I got that adds some like negative point tokens just to spice it up a bit. So that is Sequoia. And finally, there's Mountain Goat, which is a re-implementation of a German game called Level X that I don't think many people played. Uh, but this is a really cool kind of, whoop, there's another box thing. There we go. Uh, this is sort of like a King of the Hill game where you have these different cards. And it doesn't really show this very well here on the back of the box, but all those cards that you see there at the top form these different mountains. They're like different steps that you are trying to get these goats to go up. And you can send your goats on each of these mountains to climb up them. And at the top, there's point tokens. So whenever you do get to the top, by virtue of rolling dice that you can then allocate to that number, then what you're going to do is you can take a point token and you can stay there and take more point tokens until you're knocked off by another player. So you have this incentive to just kind of, I wouldn't say attack other people, but it's essentially that kind of, I don't want to let someone run away with this sort of thing. So you kind of have to balance out what it is you need versus letting someone else, not letting someone else run away with stuff. I think this is the, the one game here that I'm the most excited about. The other two are really cool, but this one I think has the greatest chance of staying in the collection. And it's a neat little concept. I, I like it a lot. So hopefully those will get to the table pretty soon. All right, let's move on to uh, one more game from BoardGameTables.com, and that is Loot of Lima. Loot of Lima is... Uh, the first game of a few that I'll talk about here, not a very large number, but a few games I'm probably not going to keep. This is a deduction game, as it says here on the cover, a challenging deduction treasure hunt. Uh, and I'll show you the back of it here. So the concept behind this game is that it's kind of like Clue, where you have this location, or two locations rather, that you're trying to find these treasures in. And you have tokens that represent where the treasure is not. Everybody does. And so you're trying to figure out what everyone else's stuff is so that you can deduce, oh, the treasure must be in the only other places that are not accounted for. And the way you do this is that you roll these three dice. They're 12-sided dice, and they all have different compass directions. And then you select two of them, and you ask, do you have any tokens in between, you know, southeast and west for example let's say those are two the two that i picked and i can even set this middle thing as sort of a visual guide so that people can see this is exactly what i mean from here to here and then that person says yes i've got you know i got one token in between there and you can if you have like the same terrain type you know you got mountains you've got forests you have beaches you can also kind of uh, narrow it down even further but generally, you'll be doing every terrain type if the dice are just two different things. And after a while, you kind of start getting this sort of Sudoku-esque narrowing down of where it could be based on what other people have. Because each person has a unique thing. Um, and then as you get that down, then you start making these really cool conclusions. And then eventually, you can discover where the treasure is. I really like this game a lot. It's, it's neat. But... The issue that I have with it here is, well, there's two issues. One of them is that I also got the Search for Planet X this year, which I covered in the last video, which I love the Search for Planet X a lot. It's just one of those games that has just really sung to me quite a bit this year. It's such a smooth experience, whereas this one 
feels like it takes a little longer. And the other thing about this one too is that it's dependent on rolling dice. I'll talk more about dice here later on as I go through more of the games, but there are certain games that dice feel a little strange in, and this is kind of one of them. Uh, you have a lot of luck with where you can uh, potentially search, and when you get to the end of the game, and a lot of people may catch up and be all on the same page based on what's been revealed so far, a, a roll could make or break your game. And thankfully, there are these tokens that you can use to ask somebody a secret question, you know, if, if you don't get the dice you want. That's kind of nice. I, I do like that. But the fact that that is sort of the, the mitigation that is in the game generally means that you won't use that until the very end. And that kind of makes the game a little more scripted for me. And I don't know, it's just... I think this could have been refined maybe a little more. It was It's a reprint of an old print-and-play deduction game called Deduce or Die. Or Die. <laughs> but um, I don't know. It, it, it's a really fun game, and I highly recommend it if you like Clue. It, it's a great alternative to Clue. But I think this is one that's probably going to leave the collection. Uh, but I will say, this is definitely one of those games where a lot fits into the box, kind of like the other three smaller ones. There are so many boards here. And, you know, this pad and everything and this map and it's just uh, all the sheets of paper and they all fit in this small box. So props to board game tables for that. All right. Let's talk about a nature themed game. Honey Buzz. This is a recent addition to the collection and one that is in my top 10 of the year. I really love Honey Buzz a lot. It's a... Uh, it's a very interesting blend of mechanisms. That's kind of been my theme for 2020 has been, there hasn't been anything that's been really just super new as far as game mechanics or and innovative as far as the game mechanics go. But there have been some really innovative things in the realm of how different familiar things are combined and synergized with each other. And this is one of those games. So I'll, I'll turn the box around so you can see the actual uh, play area here. This is fascinating because it's a, a very simple economic kind of game where you're trying to sell honey, but you have to produce all the honey first in your hive, and you're trying to just get the most money by the end. And so what you're doing is you do kind of a typical worker placement thing where you send bees out to these spots. And in most worker placement games, there's this kind of uh, action... Um, tie-in where you go to a spot you get to take an action or take resources or something like that immediately but in this game you're not doing that you're taking a tile and you're putting it here in this hive layout and whenever you complete like a circle like this where there's this sort of hexagonal shape that gets formed then you get to take all the actions that are in that circle and I love that concept. It's like you're not going for actions. You're building matrices of actions, which is really neat. And the other thing, too, is that you're also trying to go out into the field to get all these different nectars, and those nectars will produce honey. But the nectars will only go into slots that match the sides of the tiles. So when you're putting the tiles down, you're also having to keep in mind what shape or what kind of color configuration you're forming with this nectar cell thing here that you're going to put the tiles into. Uh, it's just such a, an interesting puzzle. And then there's the question of when do I sell my honey? Because I can only go to the market as many times as I have a market action here. So, and then when I go there, I need to make the most of it. So do I sell a bunch of one type? Do I fulfill an order, which allows me to take another action? You know, there's all kinds of things that, that you can kind of play with here. There's a lot of replay value with these different objective cards that are in the game. And this is the deluxe Kickstarter version that I got from uh, Elf Creek Games. They're the same people who did Atlantis Rising, which was a phenomenal production. Uh, it's become my favorite game after this year. But Honey Buzz is a nice, uh, very compact, tight game with a lot of, of meat in it. It feels easy to teach. It's not particularly crazy complex. But it feels crunchy. It feels like there's there's a lot to do and uh, not enough time in which to do it. And I love that feeling. Not to mention there's a lot of bee puns in this game. 
So that is Honey Buzz. All right, let's talk about another small game, Fort. Uh, Fort is the latest release from Leader Games, who uh, L E D E R. Uh, they were the ones who did Root, and they're also the publisher behind a game next year called Oath Chronicles of Empire and Exile, which I've heard some really interesting things about. And uh, this game is a smaller card game that's a, a very interesting twist on deck building. Uh, so I'll show you the back here and also rotate the box at the same time once again. This is a fascinating... Uh, blend of mechanisms. It's a it's a reimplementation of an older uh, older meaning like maybe 2017, not not that old. Uh, an older game that with like a civilization theme called SPQF. And it kind of took place in Roman times. And uh, the whole concept behind this is that you're a kid, and like every kid, you want to uh, uh, eat pizza and play with toys with your friends and hang out in your fort in your backyard, and you're just trying to build the best fort and get the most stuff. And so what you're doing is you're trying to recruit. So you start with these two cards that are like your best friends, but you're also trying to invite all the other kids over. So you recruit friends from the park and you say, Hey, you want to come over to my house and play in my fort and stuff. And so you add those kids to your, your discard pile, like a deck builder. Right. Uh, and then on your turn, what's really interesting about this is in most deck builders, you play five cards or some number of cards. And you do all the things in those cards, and then you discard them, and you gain new cards and you put them in the discard pile. But in this game, you only play one card, and you can augment, depending on what the, the effect of that card is, that card with other cards of the same suit. So you'll notice these all have different colors, and they all represent different suits, different kinds of interests that the kids have, basically. And so if you have more, like if, if I have a shovel card, and then I have like two other shovel cards, I can augment the and boost the effect of that first card with the other ones. I don't get the actions on them, but I get to kind of boost them a little bit. Uh, the first one, that is. And then um, all that stuff gets discarded, and then the cards I don't use go out into this yard area, which is what I've been pointing to here. And this area, other kids or other players can recruit those kids. So it's basically kind of like thematically you're saying, well, you didn't play with me, so I'll play with the other kids, right? And so then they, they may go over, go over to their house. But your best friends, the, the two cards you start with, they're always, they're always going to stick with you. And that is so cool. I, I like that concept a lot. It's a very charming theme. The other thing that I, I do like about it is that each card has two different things going on, potentially. And um, one of them you get to do alone, and then the other one everybody gets to do. Uh, but if everyone else who that's not the active player wants to do it, they have to discard a card of that suit. And so that's one less card that they have in their next turn. But that's also one less card that they don't have to put in their yard. So it's a fascinating system. I, I like the way it works. I like the interaction. It's a, an odd kind of rhythm to it at first. But when you get into it, it's really fun. It kind of reminds you a little bit of Imperial Settlers Empires of the North but with a much more uh, charming theme. And it's one that I, I want to play a little bit more. It's, it's really interesting. And we'll see how it, uh, how it shakes out in the collection. So that is Fort. All right, let's talk about a game that um, I didn't really have on my radar at the start of the year, but has quickly become um, a game that I really want to get to the table more, and that is Mariposas by Elizabeth Hargrave, the designer of Wingspan, and published by AEG, who's really been on a hot streak with a lot of good games lately. So Mariposas is a game about butterflies and butterfly migration. And uh, this is such a neat... It, it feels like a, a, a really classic older game, but with a few twists that, that are very much informed by modern games. So the idea behind this is that you represent a pack of butterflies. I'm not sure what the, the term for a group of butterflies is, but a bunch of butterflies. And you you start here in uh, Michoacan, uh, Mexico, uh, where there's a, in real life, there's a butterfly preserve there. And you're going up here uh, throughout the eastern seaboard and, and whatnot, Midwest and stuff, and you're collecting flowers and stuff, and then you can 
breed new butterflies in these spaces that have these uh, uh, things here, milkweed things, uh, next to them. And you can get more butterflies out. And if you can get, like, fourth-generation butterflies, you can take them back to Mexico for points. And along the way, you're also going to all these way station cities and collecting different cards that have, like, life cycles of butterflies printed on them. It's kind of an abstract game, but I, I don't want to call it an abstract game because it does such a good job of integrating a theme about movement, like literal movement in real life with mechanisms. And that is so interesting. I, I like that. It feels kind of like a race game, but it's, it's not a race. It's just you're trying to go through all these spots before time runs out. Because you only get four, five, and six rounds um, throughout the game, that, that, or turns, I should say. And each round, there's a different objective, and usually it has to do with being in a certain part of the map or in a certain color zone or something like that, or having a different number of butterflies east of a city or that, you know, that kind of thing. So you're kind of having to plan things out on the fly, so to speak. It's a really neat idea. And I, I'm really hoping that there, there's an expansion that gets released for this because I could see much more um, things that to add to this game as a possibility. Like, that would be really cool. Also, these flower tokens, if they made plastic chips for those, I would totally buy those. Those would be fantastic. So, yeah, all in all, this game is just a beautiful production, a great game to play. It feels really satisfying to get your butterflies up here and back again. It, it's like, it's a journey, and you feel like you learn a little bit about the real-life migration of butterflies. So, that's Mariposas. Okay. Um, let's talk about another thing that's kind of nature-adjacent. Fossilus. This is a, a game I have not yet played. I just got it for Christmas. And uh, it's from a company that I have not bought anything from before, but I'm very interested in what they have to offer, and that is Kids Table Board Games. I'm going to pan up so you can see that a little bit better. Kids Table Board Games is a, a very interesting company. They've done a few games. A lot of them are very small, uh, sort of like board game tables, I guess. But their whole premise is really fascinating, where they make games that gamers can play very casually and, and very in a very accessible way. But there are also games with modular rule sets that you can take out things so that kids could play them. And that's really neat. I, I mean, obviously not every single game will be a hit, but this one looks really fun. It's a set collection game of sorts with this 3D dig site kind of thing where you're trying to extract dinosaur bones. And then you turn those bones into dinosaurs, and there's different kinds of sets you're building with what kind of dinosaurs there are, and tools that you can buy that allow you to do crazy things. But I just love this dig site thing, because you're having to move these tiles around. It's kind of like a, a sliding tile puzzle. But if you go off the edge, like if a tile gets pushed off the edge, then you can get into what's underneath it. That's really neat. I, I like that a lot. It's fun. It's It's definitely got a a very engaging kind of puzzle to it. You're trying to sort of knock other people off the board, maybe. But it doesn't feel... I don't think it would feel super punishing. It's one of those things that uh, you have a lot of freedom in. Um, but yet there's this there's this timer in the game of, of taking these plaster tiles that you can then use in digs. And then if you collect enough plaster, then the game timer runs out. So... It's, it's cool. It, it's, it looks really cool. I'm looking forward to playing playing it. I wish I had backed this on Kickstarter because it would have come in a, in a nice box with a bunch of expansions in it. But alas and alack, I, I missed out on that one. So I'm looking forward to this one. I think I'm going to be playing this so, uh, pretty soon. So uh, hopefully that will go well. Okay. Let's talk about the second game that might leave the collection, and that is Iwari. Iwari is a, um, a very simple area control game. This is the deluxe chunkified version that, as I like to call it, that came from Kickstarter from uh, Thunder Griff Games, and they have a, a very high production pedigree. Iwari is a re-implementation of an older Michael Schott game from 2000, uh, 20 years ago now, wow. 
uh, called Web of Power. And in it, you are basically just laying these tents and totems down on the board. So this is the board here, and the board has all these different regions or territories as they call it. And the game kind of has a dawn of civilization sort of theme going on. It's very abstract, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. But what you're doing is that you're playing cards kind of like in a ticket to ride sort of way so that you can then get your stuff out on the board. And uh, the cards correlate to each territory color, basically. So you have th the ability to play three cards uh, to do up to two actions, put two things down in one area. That's the three, two, one rule, as they call it. And it's a very simple rule set. But yet the scoring is really interesting because you're scoring each territory for the tents that you put on these spaces. And uh, what's really fun about that is that the next person down will score whatever the next person above them has put in. So, for example, let's say purple put in three here, and then blue comes in and puts one. Blue would score three, and purple would score for everything being four. And so, like, you could do a minimal amount of effort if somebody does so goes in so heavily in an area. And I think that's really fascinating. I, I like that concept a lot. Uh, you also get points for making, like, paths of different tents and stuff. And then the totems are interesting because you get to score the connections between areas. So you have this little marker and you go in order around the board around these different numbers. And if you have a you know majority or at least are in the lead in both of the areas that form the connection, then you add those up and you can um, you can get that that connection scored. I have only played this game solo, so I'm, full disclaimer, I have not played this with people yet. And the solo mode was kind of a little weird. Uh, it works, but it is a little open-ended, and it feels a little strange to play. So I want to wait until I get this played with actual human beings before I really pass judgment on this one. But I will say, right off the bat, that I feel like I'm in a different place now with board gaming than I was when I first backed this on Kickstarter. Back then I was a little bit more into abstract games like this where there's not really much of a theme. And I'll talk more about theme later on, but nowadays I do feel like I need some theme in a game to kind of t help me get going. And in some cases help teach the game. Otherwise it can just feel like a bunch of rules, right? And thankfully the rules here are really simple but it belongs to a game mechanism category, in this case, area control, that has so many thematic games associated with it. And uh, I don't know if this one is going to stay in the collection. So I, we'll see, we'll see. I, I do like the game. I, I think it's, it's great. I, I think it's, it's got a nice set of me mechanics and different ways to score. I think that's cool. But we'll see how it, how it lasts. So that is Iwari. Okay, let us now talk about Viscounts of the West Kingdom, probably one of the heaviest games in terms of complexity that has come into the collection this year. Viscounts of the West Kingdom is a uh, the third game in the West Kingdom series after uh, Architects and Paladins of the West Kingdom. And this one is very different. Uh, it's At first, I was kind of taken aback by just how different it was. The previous two games were very worker placement focused. And this one is kind of a deck building rondelle game. So you can see here there's this board. It's not very clear in the photo, but there's like this 3D castle here in the middle with meeples in it. But what's really interesting about this game is that much like Fort, there's this thing where you're playing only one card from your hand on your turn. But you have this rotating kind of conveyor belt of cards in front of you on your board where you put one in and slide one off. And so these cards have different icons in them that represent the actions that you could potentially take in the game. And there's four of these actions, and you can only do one on your turn. You can do trading, which is basically converting these icons on the cards that look like money bags into resources like money and gold and... Um, where the 
there too, inkwells and uh, stone. And those are the things that fund all the other things you can do. So stone allows you to do the building action. Uh, gold allows you to put people here into the castle. And um, oh, what was the other one? Inkwells. Inkwells allow you to do uh, put the um, uh, get these manuscripts, which is kind of like a set collection thing. So there's all these different interlocking things you could do, and they're all conducted by this rondelle where you move this horse around, this guy in a horse, and you, you get to do actions that are adjacent to where you are. So the outer part of the board allows you to build and trade. The inner part of the board allows you to put people in the castle and get manuscripts. So you're having to think about your movement and then what you're doing and what everyone else is doing and then what the cards that are on your board are. And there's all these different things that allow you to rearrange the cards on your board. So if I don't want a card to drop off and I want to keep it on for an ongoing effect, um, I don't know. It's, it's just a really cool set of things going on that are very well interlocked. And uh, I'm starting to appreciate a lot more games that have that kind of feel to them where the, the, the systems just work so well together. This is one that I... I was a little taken aback at first at just how different the turns felt from Architects and Paladins. Those are worker placement games that where you put meeples down and you get to do something right away and your turn's over. This game, you have to put a card down, push another card off, you check for corruption icons that move you on this track on your board that gives you corruption or virtue. And then you then get to move your horse guy around the board, you get to take an action, and then you get to potentially recruit a new card from where you are. And then you get to, if your corruption and virtue collide, you have to resolve that. And then you draw back up to your hand limit. And there's just so many things going on in this game. But it's really satisfying to play and pull off some cool moves. And I like it for that reason. Another thing I appreciate is that Garfield Games has had a really nice track record of uh, supporting their games with uh, expansions and I think 2021 we're going to be seeing some expansions for all three West Kingdom games so I'm really excited about that. So that's Viscounts the West Kingdom. Okay let's talk about a game that I just got recently that I haven't yet played. Um, that is Dale of Merchants, another deck building game. This is a, kind of becoming a theme now isn't it? So this is a much uh, simpler deck building game for two to four players where you're a, a woodland animal faction. That's another theme that's kind of becoming prominent in the collection with Rude and Everdell, huh? Huh, anyway. Uh, you're playing as one of these animal factions, and uh, what's really neat about this is that you mix all the cards together, and you have this, this kind of market of cards like most deck-building games, and you're putting them into your hand right away. So this is not a game where you buy cards and they go into your discard pile. You're buying cards to then go in your hand that you can then use immediately on your next turn. And it's really fascinating how that works. It's just a, it's, it's a nice concept, and I wish more deck builders did it. But what you're ultimately trying to accomplish here is that you're trying to build these sets of cards that add up to different numbers. So you have one, two, three, four, five. You can put the values of the cards as they state there to add up to something, or you know, put just one card that has that number on there. Whatever you do, you're getting rid of cards from your your collection of cards. And uh, I find that really interesting. It's just a, a, a really neat idea that takes something that we know about in deck building, where you trash cards out of the game, and usually for an efficiency reason, like you want to draw more of the good things that you want to do. But it makes that the win condition, it's not victory points where you're just trying to buy cards that have points on them. You're literally trying to get rid of cards to win and be the first to build all eight of these piles. That's a neat idea. I, I'm looking forward to playing this one because there's this is the collection, the big box, where it's, it's a normal size box. But there's 27 different decks of like 15 cards apiece in this box, and each deck represents a different animal faction. And I really like that. It's it's a neat idea. I'm I'm excited to play this one at some point soon. All right. Uh, let's talk about a couple of games from Arcane Wonders and the Dice Tower Essentials Collection. 
Uh, this is Aquatica. This was a game that I played earlier in the year, back in uh, February at the Dice Tower West convention. Uh, back then, it wasn't even a part of the Arcane Wonders family yet. It was still the original Russian printing from Cosmodrome games. But this game is a, a fascinating tableau building game with cards. Uh, essentially what you're doing is that you're just trying to rule the underwater landscape. And so you're, you're taking all these cards from a market and you're putting them into this, this uh, dual layered board. It's, it's not very obvious that there's two layers to this, but these cards slide in to this thing. And each card has all these different bubbles on it that represent levels of the card that you're having to sift through before it's ready to be scored. And each of these things uh, can either be empty, which means that you have to raise it some other way, or it has an action or something on it, like a benefit, that you can get to then raise it. Sometimes those benefits are spending power for future cards, and sometimes those are things like getting to recruit a character or raise another card. So it leads to this fascinating combo Fantastic system where you're like raising a card to raise another card and then you rate you get a benefit there And then that raises a different thing and then you get to score a card via a treasure chest icon And then that gets put into your pile of scored cards and just It's really neat. I, I love just the satisfaction of pulling off cool clever moves and games and this is one of those games the, one of the guys I played it with originally at the convention said it reminded him of Wingspan. I don't know if I would say it's like Wingspan. It's a... Uh, I don't even know what game I would compare it to, to be honest. It's a similar theme to Abyss, I guess. But Abyss is a very different kind of game. This is a, a fun, quick game to play. You even have variable goal tiles that you can put out here, which is the, the, like the end game trigger when somebody does all four of them. I like this one a lot. It's it's a really fun blast. So that's Aquatica. All right, the other Cosmodrome Arcane Wonders collaboration is a big heavy box, Smartphone Incorporated. Which, whoo, that this game takes the cake for the most hipster looking board game cover probably. Uh, out there and this is one that I yet have not played um, it is uh, as it says here at the top it's an economic game it's a game where you're building a smartphone company by selling phones and it's got this really neat sort of action selection thing so you'll see here that there's these different icons and each icon represents a step in the round and there's five rounds it's, it's not very long but what you're doing here is you're, you have this little tray with your pieces and you have these two tiles. And on each round, you're putting the two tiles on top of each other such that a number on the bottom is covered. And that's how many goods you're going to be producing that round, how many phones you're going to be selling. And then everything else that's revealed are the different actions you take. So then you walk through all these different steps and it's like, okay, whoever has this thing, let's go ahead and do that. And then we resolve step two. Whoever has this icon, we'll do that one. And so on and so forth. And so you're expanding and building offices in new countries and stuff. You're gaining new technologies and gaining market share and all that. It looks like a less complicated version of games like Brass and other similar train-themed games. And for that, I'm, I'm excited to play it. I think Brass is a fantastic game. It's actually one of my favorite games, but it's one of those games that, for me at least, and for the collection, I, I just can't see owning personally. I think it's a really neat game, and I get why people like it, but something like this I think is more accessible, and for that reason I, I feel more inclined to, uh, to have it be a part of the collection just for playability's sake. This is a big Kickstarter box. It's... Uh, comes with the expansion packed in, which is its own two to three player board. So the original release had a giant board like this. And a lot of people were like, eh, I don't know if, you know, two to three players, it feels as tight. So they addressed it in the expansion by creating a whole new board. And it's a double layered board with recessed spots, which is why the box is so thick. So I'm looking forward to playing this one. I think it's a, it's a neat concept. It's got this cool action selection Thing with the two tiles. I've never seen anything like that in a game before. So that is Smartphone Inc.
All right, speaking of economic games, we're going to talk about another one that uh, I haven't yet gotten to the table. pret a porter or uh, ready to wear is uh, the uh, what that translates to in English. So this is a game that came out a while back. I, I forgot what year it was, maybe 2008. It may have been later. Uh, but it's a game by Ignacy Trevicek, who did uh, Empires of the North. And uh, it's got a lot of the same kind of uh, compounding engine building elements to it. But this is more of a traditional worker placement game with a lot of economics built into it. So the premise of this is that you're running a fashion design company. And I love, uh, even though I haven't played it yet, I just love the production of this. Everything is so colorful. It represents the theme really well. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to get these uh, designs that you are investing in to come to fruition by purchasing materials from warehouses and then uh, collecting them so that you have something to showcase every fourth round at a fashion show, which is like a special round when everything gets scored and you get to sell stuff. But along the way, you get to build these buildings and hire employees that give you all these ongoing benefits. But maybe eventually you want to fire an employee and, you know, kind of just move on to something else that will help you gain benefits later on. And it, it's a very cutthroat looking game. There's always so many things you can do. Um, everything at the fashion show is pretty much ranked by whoever gets the highest, you know, quality materials or highest public relations or, you know, things like that. It's, it's really interesting looking and I'm, I'm very interested in checking out how this turned out. Um, we'll see if it stays in the collection. This is one of those ones that it looks like it could be a long game. Long games can, depending on what they are, they could be very um, hit or miss for me um, in my groups. So I'm sure this will get, we'll, we'll see some plays, but we'll see if it if it stays in the collection. Uh, I just got it for pretty cheap, so I, I think it's a really cool looking game at least, and it has some neat economic things that I like. So yeah, Preto Porte. Speaking of long games, let's talk about one of those. Forgotten Waters. Forgotten Waters is one of my favorite games of the year. It's my number two um, game of 2020. It's made it into my overall top 10. It's just such a great, fun experience. I, I, I know it's a game, but really this is more of an experience than a game. It's a, it's a pirate adventure game where you are essentially participating in sort of like a one-shot RPG. So you get to be a part of this crew, and I love how this starts. You, you build out your character by filling out a Mad Lib. A Mad Lib, which is so fun. I, it, like, when was the last time you filled out a Mad Lib? I, I know for me it's been forever. But you get to tell your backstory to the whole group, and then you have this app, which is really a, a website. You can save it on your phone if you don't want to go online while you're at your group. And the app has full voice acting from actual pretty well-known voice actors, in some cases, that are that's narrating the game and then providing dialogue for all these pirates that you are encountering along the way or are on your ship. And what you're having to do is usually there's an objective like getting to an island or collecting pieces of a map or, you know, something like that. And each person around the table has a different like thing that they're keeping track of. They're very simple things like oh, keep track of the hull or keep track of supplies or something like that. But what I love about it is that it's a game with a cooperative premise that everyone can get involved in simply by virtue of keeping track of just something. But then on top of that, there's this really fun worker placement element to it where you have a book, this big adventure location book with all these different pages with different actions and whenever you go to a new location you you flip open this book and the app has a timer and then everybody has to go in turn order and put their their person down here on one of these things without really thinking too hard about what each thing is and then you go down the list and you resolve everybody's thing i love this system it's so fun it's an evolution of uh, the crossroads kind of choose your own adventure sort of system that was in a, a previous game by this publisher Plaid Hat called Dead of Winter. Uh, but this game, in my estimation, is way better than Dead of Winter, the, the zombie game. This is just so much more 
lively and interactive and fun. And I love that the event uh, system of the crossroads choices that you're making whenever you encounter something is tracked via an, an app. I know not everyone likes apps and board games, but as far as like a dungeon master kind of function where you're keeping track of all these things, honestly, I think apps can do well at that. And you can just be free to enjoy the actual gameplay part of it. The stories are really fun and silly. You know, it's kind of the silliness of something like Pirates of the Caribbean. Um, but, you know, there's some moments of uh, uh, of sobering, you know, things as well that uh, everyone kind of sits in and listens to and, and gets involved and emotionally invested in. Uh, everyone, so I, I promised I was going to talk about die rolling here at a later point of the video. Everyone has a, a 12-sided die, and most of the actions you're going to be doing involve performing skill checks like in an RPG. And I love how the different skills in this game are things that are very piratey, like swagger and navigation and hunting and uh, brawn and stuff like that. Uh, but, you know, you do it like a normal RPG. You roll the die and you add your skill level and you add any boosts or buffs that you have. And I love the fact that the game... It's a hard game to win, but it doesn't feel overly punishing while you're playing it, which is what's fun about it. You may not win, but you also have fun along the way. And at the end of the day, that's what counts, right? The other thing that's cool about it is that when you develop your character, there's also this uh, constellation map thing that you're filling in. And even though this is a cooperative game you're also trying to beat an, your own personal goals by filling in like a, a number of those, those spots on the constellation. If you don't fill at least four, you're gonna lose, like personally. Even if you survive as a group, the entire scenario. So I love the fact that there is the same, kind of like Dead of Winter, there is this group element to it with an individual potential traitor thing, but there, it's not really a traitor thing here. It's more of like, there's the group win condition, and then there's the individual win condition. And that's that's really fun. So yeah, Forgotten Waters, if you like pirates, and you like storytelling, and you like adventure, and excitement, and magic, and fun stuff, this game is a blast. And each scenario, there's five scenarios in the book, they're, they're replayable. Uh, each of them takes about four hours. But what's cool about it is that you can split each scenario up into two parts and the app tells you when like part one ends so like if you want to pick it up on a different day you could totally do that and you could save everything and put them into bags and the captain has a little ship's log where you could like kind of like save your game like a video game and take note of what everything is on the back side of the sheet it's it's really cool uh this game i'm hoping to play this more in 2021 with big groups so that is forgotten waters All right, we are down to the final four games here. And they're all pretty big boxes, starting with It's a Wonderful World. Uh, so this is another game that I played at Dice Tower West, and I had backed it on Kickstarter around that time uh, in February. This is a very simple game. It's a card drafting game, and it comes in a pretty thick box because it has a bunch of expansion stuff packed in here that I haven't yet tried out. But the uh, the... The premise of this game, the best way I can describe it, is Terraforming Mars meets Seven Wonders. It's a card drafting game with an engine building component that feels very distilled. And uh, I love the way it feels in terms of just the progression of how you collect the cards and produce stuff. So what's neat about this, and it even tells you here what the game is and what it's about, it's this kind of tongue-in-cheek dystopian theme. It's like a utopian dystopia where, you know, there's this peaceful land, but it came at a cost of, you know, putting everyone under mind control and brainwashing and going out and fighting wars and stuff. So you have this card draft, kind of like Seven Wonders, where you pick cards out from a hand and pass it along. And then you then have these cubes that you can get from recycling stuff that you could put on cards to help build them. And then you produce resources from all these cards that are listed here at the bottom in this order. And depending on what you produce 
And if you can complete cards right away, you can add cards to the production pack that then produce right away if they have stuff that comes in later on. And then you get bonuses for producing the most of any given thing. And it, it, there's just a lot to like about this game. It's very satisfying to complete a bunch of cards and feel like you're getting uber powerful at the end. It's that feeling that you of satisfaction that you get from something like Terraforming Mars, but in a much shorter time frame. And I, I love that about this game. Uh, the other thing is that this includes an expansion um, that adds like special scoring condition cards that you can use to make the game even bigger and expand it to seven people, which is pretty cool. Um, yeah, th this, this is a game that every time I've introduced it or played it with someone, they instantly want to play it again. Uh, granted, that's only two times, I guess. But I've played it five times now. <coughs> twice the first time, excuse me. Twice the first time and then three times the, three times the, seven, the second time. Once everyone gets what it's about and what it involves, it's like, oh, we got to play it again. It's just so fun. It's a wonderful world. It's a wonderful game. Moving on to... Let's bring this one up here. This is another giant one. Super Fantasy Brawl. Uh, I'm not going to bore you with this cover. It looks like a case of beer here. Let's go and go into the back. So Super Fantasy Brawl is a big miniatures game. Uh, unfortunately, they didn't come all pre-painted like this. And you can't really see what the game involves just from looking at this, but it's essentially an arena combat game where you have like a set of three of these characters that you draft uh, and your opponent has three. You can play it with two or four people. Uh, and what you're doing here is um, you're just pitting the characters against each other. There's no dice. There's no, well, I shouldn't say there's no luck because you're drawing cards from a deck based on the heroes you get. But uh, you essentially play, it's kind of like Magic the Gathering, where there's, you know, you play cards and there's different kinds of mana on the cards and you get to use the, the energy or whatever you get to heal and attack and do all these things. But what's really neat about it is that you get to synergize this deck based on the characters you pick, which is really cool. Um, and so you can build up these crazy combos. The other thing is that the game is really quick in the sense that there's this scoring system that's kind of like a shifting thing where the crowd in this arena wants to see something different happen. And so you, they're kind of like objectives that you can fulfill and get points for. And the first person to like, I think five points uh, or something like that wins the game. So if you can fulfill those, you may not even have to knock your opponent out. You can just do different things to please the crowd and you could win. But knocking your opponent out, you know, also helps with that too. So uh, and then they respawn at the very start. So it's not like you're completely out or anything like that. The only complaint I have for about this game, honestly, is the production inside the box. I love the minis. They're really nice. I love the board. It looks really colorful. Um, but I have to admit, the trays that the minis come in are really unwieldy. Like, they're just so big. They're, they're well-produced trays, don't get me wrong, but they're so big and unnecessary. So for comparison's sake, there's an expansion that I got with the game called Force of Nature that includes three more characters, and they all fit into this tiny box with their cards. The, the base game has 12 characters, and look at all the space this takes up. I mean, this is how thick, how tall, and how wide the box is. I mean, it's just so much space. I don't think it needed to be this big, or at the very least, you could fit more stuff in the box if the trays weren't so gargantuan for the characters. But that's, you know, at the end of the day, that doesn't really have anything to do with the gameplay. This is a fun two-player game. I, I haven't tried it at four, but I hope I can at some point, because this is one of those games I want to play more. I could definitely see the potential for tournaments in a game like this. Kind of like what Magic does, but, you know, in this case, there's only so many things you can do. Uh, but the variability here is very high, especially with 15 characters with this expansion. I mean, just 15 alone is enough to mix things up quite a bit. So that is Super Fantasy Brawl, a fun arena combat game. All right. Last two games 
are some of my favorites of this year. This game, I'm not going to be able to fit the box here on the shelf very easily, uh, at least the long way. But this is Tidal Blades Heroes of the Reef. This is a Kickstarter that ran, I think, a couple years ago. It was a while back. And there were a lot of delays with the production. Uh, a lot of them not even related to the pandemic this year. But Tidal Blades, this game is just a, a really neat a collision of world building and mechanisms and just presentation. Like everything about this game is fantastic. I got the deluxe version from Kickstarter. Uh, I did a late pledge because I missed the Kickstarter. And it came with this really cool hardcover art book that is great for a coffee table. Let me turn this around here so you can see. Well, the artwork is gorgeous. You probably want to see the components, right? So this game is a worker placement game that has a lot of things going on that all synergize in a really fun way. So you're operating a, a character here um, that you can put on the board. And essentially what you're doing is you are participating in this tournament to select the next tidal blade, which is like an elite guard of like this fictional island realm. Um, it's, it's a very anime kind of, kind of theme, but it's really cool. And what I love about this is that there's different places you could go to that have layers of things to do. So you have like an action that you take, like a normal work replacement action when you put your piece there. And then you have like a location action that you could take um, that's applicable to any of the spaces. And then you could attempt a challenge, which is a way that you can increase all your stats. So you have these different dials on your board that represent kind of how powerful you are. Uh, you have Focus, which allows you to roll more dice during challenges and fighting monsters. You've got Spirit, which allows you to uh, get more out of these stunt cards. You've got um, Resilience, which allows you to refresh and upgrade more dice at the end of each round. And then you've got Synergy, which basically allows you to um, have more character cards that give you more variable uh, asymmetric powers. All of these things are so interesting. And what I love about this game is that you don't have a lot of time to do everything. You're like, you have to pick what you want to do. You, do you want to focus in on spirit and synergy? Do you want to focus in on resilience and synergy or focus? Or You know, there's just so many different things you do. You get to roll dice to compete in these challenges so you can advance your traits and stuff. You also fight monsters here at the... Uh, um, they call it the fold. It's kind of like the end of the world where all the monsters are crawling through and stuff. And you have to get them before they invade the city and, and cause damage and stuff. And you can also get more trade advancements that way. But this dice system, I don't know if it's very visible here, but I'm going to move it over this way so you can see this edge. Um, you have this kind of tech tree that you're going up with these dice where you get to upgrade the dice along these two different paths that then split into two more paths that all have to do with the four different traits that you're trying to advance in the game. And this version of the game comes with this cool dice tray that's like the, the Colosseum kind of arena thing in the game that the stuff is being held in. I love this game. I, I've only played it solo so far, and the solo mode is really, really cool. But the multiplayer, I'm very much looking forward to playing that. It's just got so many things that I like. It's got worker placement. It's got a little bit of engine building. It's got a, a nice theme. Again, a, a theme like this that has this kind of production is going to win out over something that's abstract. And that's that's something that I can't deny after this year. Like Especially after playing games like Forgotten Waters, this this kind of game really shines. Where the, there's a lot of world building, a lot of love that gets put into this this landscape that they've built. Like the art book even includes stories from the world. I mean, that's just how amazing this is. So, yeah, I, I'm really excited to get this more to the table next year. That is Tidal Blades Heroes of the Reef. All right. Well, I intentionally saved the best for last. And this game is quickly shot up into my top 10. And that is Dwellings of Elder Bale. This game is just a fascinating blend of stuff. 
Um, and I was really nervous about this game at first, but it was on Kickstarter in August of 2019 or so. And I got to play a prototype later on in February this year at Dice Tower West, where a representative from the publisher uh, came with a prototype copy. And I, I had a headache the day I played it, so I, I didn't really get to fully enjoy it. But um, when I got my copy in the mail, I immediately got a couple of people together and we played it, and I fell in love with it. I absolutely fell in love with it. This game is just... Like, I don't, in the words of one reviewer, I, I don't believe there's such a thing as a perfect game. But I think this is a perfect game for my own tastes and preferences. It's not for everybody, but just the kinds of things that I really enjoy in games, all those things are, almost all those things are here. So I'll show you kind of what's going on here with this. There's a lot in this big, thick box. Uh, so this is a, a worker placement game with area control and tableau building and fighting monsters and just so much stuff going on that when I first saw this, I was thinking to myself, mm, excuse me, um, this could be a disaster. Like this could easily be a disaster. This could be a super convoluted complex game with everything thrown into the kitchen sink. It could just be way too much, you know, is this actually going to work? And I'm happy to say it works. It's a game where you are you're a fantasy faction. So like here we have the Storm Horde. Uh, that's like one of the, the air groups. And each faction represents a different element. So you have air and earth and fire and water and light and dark and then order and chaos. Those are the, the eight elements. And so you play with the elements that your factions represent among the players. And then you add two more that you could potentially... Uh, invest in throughout the game. And what you're doing is you're exploring this fantasy landscape and ultimately settling down there by creating these houses or dwellings out of the workers that you're putting down. And the worker placement is, in this game is really interesting because it's a, it's a fascinating uh, like ex exploration of the concept of shifting utility, where you have these different tokens here in that represent resources and you take them whenever you take one of them at least when you go into that spot but what's interesting about it is that the the tokens are all different so you the next person to go in there might get something else you know, depending on what the the token is and they're all face up so you'll see it as soon as it gets revealed right um but something else may have a different kind of meaning for another person What's really cool about this, though, is that you're not only collecting tokens that you could then discard for the resources printed on them. You could keep them, and then you collect these cards, and then you slot these tokens in here. And what you, these cards do is that whenever you're pulling back workers from the board, you're not just throwing away your turn and saying, okay, I pull everyone back, and then next time I'll be ready to start again. You can activate this tableau in front of you and get all the stuff in these cards. It's like, hey, if I pay a gem, I'm gonna get a hammer and a gold, or if I pay a scroll or a tool or a hammer, I'll, I'll get to roll dice and get a bunch of stuff. It's such a, a neat concept. It's one that I, uh, I, I know it's not a new concept, but the way it blends in with all the mechanisms is very simple to learn. This is a, not a, 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 like a shallow game, but it's a game that I can pull out and when I teach it, everything just makes sense. And uh, all the people I've taught it to so far have just instantly picked up on everything. And they're not all people who enjoy games with battling and conflict, you know, because in this game, you're, you're going to fight each other and monsters and stuff. And the fighting is not really all that punishing. You know, if you lose, you get sent to the underworld, which is this, you know, kind of holding area like jail. But then when you pull everyone back, you get to take those people back. Only you don't get to activate cards with them. So the gameplay is just really silky smooth. It's just one of those things that I, I love it when, when designers know kind of the cadence that their game involves and that turns that are quick and snappy, but yet make you feel like you're doing a lot can be very satisfying. The other thing that's great about this, this game is that it includes these uh, game trays, there's a company called Game Trays, their, their logo's right there, that produce these inserts, and a lot of them are for Kickstarter games. 
And a lot of Kickstarter campaigns have them listed as kind of a benefit that you would get if you back the game. But in this game, it's not just a storage solution for a big box. These are things that you pull out that you make a part of the game. You put these card trays out there and you use them. You put these trays with the player pieces and you store things in them during the game. You actually make use of that. From a production standpoint, this raises the bar significantly. Uh, I cannot wait to see what other companies do. Uh, like this company, Breaking Games, they're, a, comp they're a, a publisher that normally does very light family weight games. This is kind of an anomaly for them. But, oh my goodness, I just cannot imagine anybody else producing this after the fantastic job they did. It's just that good. It's a fun, satisfying game to play. It, it's got a lot of variability with the elements, with the different monsters that come out, with the cards that you customize differently every game. Yes, there is some luck in it, but again, this is another one of those games with dice that at first, maybe if, if you had shown me this two or three years ago, I would have been kind of like, eh, I don't know, dice and luck and stuff. I hate luck. But there's just something that's so fun and variable about it here. Um, I mean, sometimes you lose battles and it can be rather, you know, kind of frustrating. But then you just get back right into it and you're, you're continuing to play. And there's cards that you can use that help mitigate the luck a little bit. And so you have to make all these really tactical decisions. Easily one of the best games I've played. Uh, this is my number two game of all time. It's, it's, only, it's second only to Atlantis Rising, which is still my favorite game. Uh, but it's one that I am looking forward to playing a lot more. I, I'm excited to play this every time I get it to the table. And if you're looking for a big, epic game to invest in, whenever this gets a reprint, I highly recommend checking it out. It's well worth the, the cost. All right. Well, that is the uh, conclusion for this video. It's gone on for over an hour. Wow. Uh, I figured it was going to be somewhere around here, but not this long. Uh, thank you all so much for watching. If you've stuck around to the end, uh, I really appreciate it. I hope uh, I wasn't too boring to listen to. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed these different games, or at least just learning a little bit about them, if nothing else. Um, I don't know what 2021 is going to involve. I'm, I don't know if I'm going to be buying very many games in 2021. I always say that at the beginning of the year, and then stuff happens. Uh, I still have a, a pretty good number of Kickstarters from this past year in 2019 even that have yet to deliver. So, yeah, I, for that reason, I'm kind of reticent about getting even more stuff. At least not without getting a new shelf, which I'm hoping won't happen this year. I'm going to try to delay that as long as I can. Um, but yeah, I, if there's one hope I have for 2021... It's weird. I wouldn't have said this back in 2019, but after this year, I really want conventions to come back. I really, really want conventions to come back. Uh, I went to Gen Con in 2019. I think I may have mentioned that in a previous video, which is a big industry kind of convention where there's a lot of, you know, business going on. But there's a lot of people who attend who just want to see the, the trade show floor, uh, you know, all that stuff. And I was one of those people. I just wanted to see what it was like. And it was very overwhelming, like really overwhelming. But I would not mind going back and seeing it again if it, if it happens this year. I mean, it's in August, so I don't know if conventions will be happening by August, but I'm going to cross my fingers and hope for the best. So anyway, thank you all so much for watching. Um, if you like this video, don't forget to, to hit the like button and subscribe if you haven't already. And I will catch you next time. So take care and I will see you then.